Morning. 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 I, uh, before I get started real quickly, I would like to ask uh, if you boys can bring up the slide for VBS real quick. I know that's out of order. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, kind of a big thing. We're going to be partnering with another church for VBS this year. And so I wanted to invite all of you to participate and be a part of it. Uh, we're looking for people to help with VBS. So if you would like to be a part of VBS, it's going to be on July 22nd through the 25th. That's going to be a Monday through Thursday. So it's going to be a day shorter than like a five-day VBS. And that's typically because the numbers drop on Friday. So uh, if you would like to help out with VBS, we would be glad to have you be involved. Everything from uh, being a leader with a group of kids to traveling around to uh, helping out with the snacks, uh, like serving out the snacks. Uh, if you want to help out with uh, I can't even think else. The Bible stories and stuff like that. Let me know. I would be so glad to have you be involved. And so this is a, this is kind of a big way for us to to engage with children and make an eternal impact in their lives through a four-day week of just presenting the gospel to them. All right. So that's it on that. Will you open up in prayer with me, please? Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We just thank you that we have beautiful sunshine, that spring is such a, a crazy time. We have a, a beautiful day one day and a cold day the another. But you know what, Lord? You are in control of it. And you know what's going on. You, Lord, you, you know that, that in my own heart as I'm wrestling with things and, and trying to when I have kids who are fighting with one another in the pew and, you know, I come up here and I got to have the smile on my face and, and be like, hey, everything's all right. But the truth is I just, I get frustrated sometimes. But I think we all deal with that, Lord. So I ask you just to give my own heart calmness and peace. And that I would focus on you as we go through your word. And that your word would change even my heart and change me. Open our hearts to your word. Draw us closer to you. And let us be a people who seek you out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to this week, uh, last week we actually started a new series called Finding Enough. And I know that we, it was Easter week, so I didn't talk about it a whole lot. But we are in the middle or just beginning of a se series, Finding Enough. And it's talking about where do we find enough from. We're going to be talking about do we, finding enough in Christ, finding enough in relationships. And so we're going to be moving through scripture. And right now we're going to be in the book of Colossians. And we're going to be in, um, if you don't have a Bible, feel free to go ahead and pull out a Bible in front of you. You're going to be on page 1,390. As we're going to be in Colossians 1 this morning. And so we're going to be talking about this series of Fighting Up, and we're going to be talking about a few different subjects. But before we go much further, I want to tell you a little story. And this truly happened uh, not all that long ago, just a couple years ago. That the, the, the police officers in Dakota County, Minnesota, pulled over a vehicle. And when they pulled over the vehicle, they, they realized that some of the people in the vehicle, especially this one individual, had a warrant out for his arrest. And while they were searching him, he tried to use a get out of free jail card. So let me explain how this happened. The police are driving, and they see a car ahead of them where the, one of the gentlemen, the passengers, is not wearing a seatbelt. So they pull the car over, and as they pull the car over and they run the place, they realize that the car, the, the person that the car is registered to, has a warrant out for their arrest. So they begin to question the driver and realize it's not the same driver. But they then begin to talk to the passenger who has no seatbelt on. And they run his background, they realize, yeah, he has a warrant out for his arrest. And so they begin to immediately arrest him and they begin to search him. And as they're searching him, they reach into his pocket and pull out his wallet. And in his wallet, he has a Monopoly card, the get out of free jail card. You guys know that card? He has that card. And they go, what is this? And the man says, well, I just carry it with me just in case. <laughs> and the police laughed. And they arrested them anyways. <laughs> now what does that have to do with this morning? 
Well, this man ended up in jail, and the only relationship is, is that this man ended up in jail, and the letter we're going to be reading from is from a man who was written in prison. That's the only correlation. So we are reading a letter from Paul while he was written in jail. Now, this is important to recognize that this is a letter. I know we, we, we look at this and we call it, you know, it's one of the books of the Bible, but this is actually a, a letter written by Paul and Timothy to the church of Colossae, who is also in decline. This is a, once a major city that's kind of lost its luster. There's other cities that have grown up around it, and this city is slowly in decline. And Paul's writing, like I said earlier, writing from prison. And so that's going to change how we look at this letter as we move forward. Now, why is he writing to this church? This is not a church that he planted. But he recognizes that it's a Christian church, a church that was doing well. But then heresy began to enter into the church. People began to change scripture. See, the church began with, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. And then other people began to enter the church. And they said, yes, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. And you need to do this, this, and this. Jesus plus this. That's what's going on here. Here we have a man who's... I'm sorry, here we have a group of people who are saying, you know what, you need to be a follower of Jesus. You need to accept Jesus, but you also need to follow the laws. The Old Testament laws, you need to be doing that. Or, you need to be a follower of Jesus, and you need to be going after these social issues and taking care of those. And you know, that's, that's current today. We still struggle with that, where people like Jesus plus something else. You want to be a follower of Jesus? Great! Be a follower of Jesus, but you also need to do this to enter into heaven. And Paul is writing to say, no, that is not true. And he jumps right into it, uh, talking about redemption and forgiveness. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verse 13 through 14 real quick. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Immediately, Paul begins to clarify. He just flat out says right at the beginning, it is faith in what Christ has done and accepting Him as Savior that rescues you. It's not Jesus plus something else. It is Jesus alone. And then in the next few verses, we're going to be looking at verse 15 through, I believe it's 20, yes, 15 through 20. It's what's considered a hymn. Now what's interesting is when we think of a hymn, we typically think of a song. You know, we think of the hymnals that are in front of us. We're pulling out a hymnal. But what a hymn simply means, it means to praise. And these particular hymn, or this particular hymn, is cut up into two different parts. And the two different parts focus on different areas of Christ. And so we're going to be looking at these two different hymns. Now, it is believed that the early church would actually recite this part in their services. And that they would go over this every single week so people would remember the simplicity of the gospel. So let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to look at the first part of this hymn today. We're going to go and look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. And number 1 on your outline says, Embrace Christ over creation. Embrace Christ over creation. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Do you recognize that part right there? Let's look right at the beginning of that. He is. You're going to see this twice in this set of scripture. He is the firstborn, and in this case, of all creation. And we see that in chapter 15. That's, that's the uh, verse 15. And that's the beginning of the hymn. And then you're going to see this again in verse 18. He is the firstborn from the dead. And it's, it's, a, it's a separate focus. So you're going to see this twice. So if you have a Bible and you make notes, go ahead and underline he is. This is a, a good point to point out. He's got, this is his first subject that he's talking about. 
Now the New Testament and the Old Testament Scripture tells us that no one has seen God. No one has seen God the Father in heaven but we've seen Christ who is God and we're going to be talking about that right now. But no one has seen God. In John chapter 1 verse 18 it says no one has seen God at any time the only begotten God who is the who is in the bosom of the father he has he has explained him no one has seen the father but we have seen Jesus and he's not just an image of God he is God in the flesh there's a difference here See, an image of God is like you and I. We are made in the image of God, in His likeness. We are similar. We are creative. We laugh. We love. But that's not Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. Flesh. Phrase right here, He is the being the firstborn. Being the firstborn does not mean He was created. Rather, it's talking about his role, his position, that he is supreme, that he is sovereign, that he reigns as king. Firstborn doesn't always indicate in scripture, meaning that you're the firstborn child. In fact, scripture talks about King David as being the firstborn. But the thing is, in his family, he's actually the last one of his siblings. He's the youngest one. As far as being a king over Israel, he's not even the first king. He's the second king. And yet, Scripture refers to him as the, the firstborn of Israel. So that's what's going on in this case. It's talking about how Jesus, he is the firstborn. He is the one who reigns over all creation. But what gives Jesus the right to reign over all creation? Because he made it. If you make something, you can do what you want with it because you own it. If you make a, a, a clay pot, you can give it away. Or you can break it. No, I'm not breaking any pots this week. But you can do whatever you want with your creation. And here is Jesus the Creator. Colossians 1.16 tells us these, tells us this, sorry. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. You were created for him. This is important to understand how creation works. See, because Jesus is an agent of creation, that means he was not a created being. A created being, well, it says all things were created. If Jesus was a created being, that would mean that he would have to create himself, which is impossible. You can't create yourself. But because God, because Jesus is God in the flesh, He is able to create. So when people say, oh, Jesus is a created being. At one point in time, He never exists, but then God created Him. That's not true because it says all things. And when that, that word there, all things, in Scripture and in Greek, it means all things. When you're looking at 1 John and we read that the word created all things, it means that Jesus created all things. Things And because he is the creator, he cannot be a created being. And so that's one of the ways we know that Jesus is God in the flesh. And he has created such beautiful things. We have the, the beauty of the, the Santium River right out here. We have, uh, I can never pronounce this waterfall very well, but the, the Monoma. Mo, Mo, thank you. That waterfall that looks so beautiful and so majestic, he created it. 
When we are wowed by the plants, we go, look at those things. Again, that is a reflection of Jesus. It is to exclaim his majesty and his wonder. And that's what creation is about. It's about showing how majestic and wonderful God is. And we can see the fingerprints of Jesus on all of it. But Paul's not just talking about the things here on earth. Recognize it talks about heaven and earth, the visible and invisible. See, God created, Jesus created all things on earth, all of our solar system, all of our universe, but he also created heaven and the angelic beings, the invisible, the things we cannot see. So Paul's pointing out how powerful and amazing Jesus is, that he is supreme ruler over all. Verse 17 goes on to say, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the center of all things. He pulls everything together. Even our calendar today is based on the birth of Jesus. I know that we have just used to having the idea that there's always been this calendar. It's just kind of been here. My parents use it. My grandparents use it. As far as we can remember, we've been using the calendar that we use today. But here's the truth. There have been several different calendars throughout history. Oftentimes, you would have a king, a very powerful king, come into position, come into power, and he would say, you know what? We are going to create a calendar so that we can get organized. And we're going to base the first year, year number one, based on my birthday. Because I I am that amazing. <laughs> How many of us are using any of those calendars? Those calendars have come and gone, but the calendar that we use today that is based on the birth of Christ is the one that not just the Western world uses, but that the, pretty much the entire world uses, unless you're North Korea. But pretty much everybody recognizes this calendar. Because that's how significant and important Christ is. But he's not just important to our calendars, he's also important to us. He holds all scripture together. If we did not have Christ, everything in our universe would fall apart. Because he is the center of everything. Jesus Christ is supreme. The Old Testament was talked about Christ in the sense of there is a coming promise. The New Testament talks about Christ as that promise from the Old Testament has now been realized. And the book of Revelation talks about the promise of Jesus returning. See, all scripture from Genesis to the book of Revelation points back to Christ. And that He is supreme. Number two on your outline. Embrace Christ over the church. Embrace Christ over over the church. Verse 18, we begin to, to transition to a new part of the hymn. Recognize if you, if you have your Bibles and you make uh, notes in your Bibles, go ahead and under, underline again, He is. Because this is where the new transition, this is the second part. So He is Christ over creation. That's the, the old part of Scripture. Now he's going to be talking about a new part. The new part of creation. And that is the church. It's not to say one is more valuable than another because Jesus is supreme over all creation, all beings, the entire universe. And that's the first section. But the second section is about you and I. That Jesus is supreme over everything in our lives. That He created us. That He made us. That we are to have relationships with Him. 
some people look at the, the church as kind of more of like a, a hobby horse. Something that you just kind of do or people that just gather. But the truth is, Jesus says, the church is supposed to be about making disciples. Here's what's interesting. I, I hear people talk about, oh, we need to make converts and converts. And I go, actually, that's not correct. Scripture does not tell us to make converts. If you were to sit there and go through Scripture and say, okay, where does Jesus say to go make converts? That's not what he says. Jesus tells us that we are to make disciples. And we're supposed to be focused on the church, on building up the body of church, of the church. We're supposed to lead people in, into, into God's family, and then we're supposed to disciple them. And you may say, oh, that's Paul's passion. Paul's always talking about discipleship. He started doing this a couple months ago, and he doesn't seem to stop. He keeps going on and on. Here's the thing. This is not just my obsession. This is the obsession of Christ. That he wants us to be disciple makers. He wants us to be a people who are being discipled. And that we are growing. So let's go ahead and look at this. We're, I, I've been talking about this verse 18. Let's go ahead and read it right now. The church, and he is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead will come to have a place in everything. Without Christ and His resurrection, church would be pointless. Paul writes that in 1 Corinthians 15. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are, we are of all men most to be pitied. But because Jesus rose again, the church finds life. And the church is something that people should be marveling at. Wow. Those people at that church, wow. They're, they're different. I used to know that guy. He was a jerk. He was always getting into trouble. He was doing this and he was doing that. And I, I really didn't like him. And then he started going to church and being a Christian. I just kept waiting for him to change, to go back to his old ways. I was like, okay, well, this is temporary. We'll see. But man, it's been five years now. And he's still, still talking about Jesus. And he's changed so much. Look at him. I, I, I used to talk to that girl over there. My goodness, you talk about somebody who just nitpicked at everybody. She let everybody know what was going on in everybody else's life. But look at her. She's changed. I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but man, something's changed in her. The church is to be a witness for Christ that the world marvels at because Christ is supreme over our life. He transforms us. And we are eternal beings. You know, I, I think so often... This demonstration has been done by multiple people. Assume that this rope never ended. I don't even know if I could do it. Throw it over there. That's a long rope. I can keep pulling, and it never ends. And it goes on and on. And, and this is our life here on earth. This little purple part is our life here on earth. And we spend so much time of our life focusing on, on this part of our life so that we can focus on this tiny little black part so that we can go ahead and, and live this great little life where we can retire, we can enjoy things, and we, we spend all this purple part of our life focusing on these retirement years. And then when we finally get to those retirement years, we're, we're too old to even enjoy half the things. Yeah, I can finally have all the steak I want. Too bad I don't have teeth. <laughs> but we spend so much of this portion of our life focused on this tiny little spot right here. When the truth is, shouldn't we be focusing on all of the rest of our life and eternity? It just goes on and on and on. Instead of focusing on that tiny little section way down there somewhere. 
We are eternal creatures. When you accept Christ, you are a follower of Christ and, and you will live for Christ for eternity. So it should change how we live our life. It should change how we, we treat people and talk to our family members. It should change how we, how we work. It should change how we live out our summer. It should change the types of risks we're willing to take because we recognize that they have eternal value. But how do we live this out practically? Well, when we meet and greet, instead of going to the people that you know, Hit the people you don't know very well. What about that family that you see at church but you haven't invited over for lunch? What about meeting with that person who just looks like they need Maybe we could get a book together and we could pray. There are so many different ways that our little decisions could have huge impacts on other people's lives. When Jesus rose from the grave, it was like our inauguration of the church. It launched a church body to live a life for Christ. It's not that the church replaces Jesus' previous glory and all of his creation, but rather it adds to who he is. So are we focused on that little bit of black, or are you focused on the rest of eternity? There's a lot more of this. There is, uh, I can't find out of the section now, than this. Verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all fullness to dwell and all of God's attributes. Christ, his, his word, his spirit, his wisdom, his glory, all of that is in Christ. And that should be significant in our life. Because we have God who is in the flesh, who was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death on the cross. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Jesus was crucified so that we can have a relationship with him. He did it for us. The truth is, as we talked about last week, our lives are broken because of choices we have made, because we are full of sin. And we are responsible for our sin. But Jesus wanted us to have a relationship with Him, with the Father in Heaven. So He gave up His life. He suffered on our behalf, paid our penalty, so that we could be reconciled with our Father in Heaven. Because <coughs> only the blood of Christ washes away our sins. But we need to come to the end of ourselves, submit ourselves to Christ and say, Christ, Jesus, you are the only Savior. You are God in the flesh. You died on the cross as payment for my sin. You rose again on the third day and you saved me. If I call upon your name to be my Savior, I know that you will accept me and you will forgive me of my sins. And submitting to Christ and recognizing Jesus as supreme. Is Jesus supreme in your job? Is he supreme in your, in your home? Is he going to be supreme on how you live out your life this summer? And even in the small things, the small decisions you make, Jesus is supreme. And in the big things, Jesus is supreme. Because he, as scripture tells us, holds all things together. So what do we do with this? Go ahead and look on your outlines. Your next steps. 
So how are you going to orientate yourself to the king of creation this summer? And how will you remind yourself in the midst of your plans and goals that you are not the point of everything? You are not the point of everything. How are you going to remind yourself? Because it's going to get busy. The next one is, what are some practical ways you can take risks to bring glory to God and the church this coming year? And it doesn't necessarily have to mean like you have to do it in this building. Remember, this is a building. This is not the church. You are the church. So how are we going to represent Christ as a church this summer? Let's go ahead and close up in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We just thank you that we could focus on, on you. And not just today, not just tomorrow, not just this summer, not just our retirement years, not just the, how we want to spend the last year of our life, but recognizing that you are supreme, Lord. You're supreme over all creation. You created everything, Jesus. I mean, the earth and the heavens and the angels and the people, you created that. And that you are supreme over the church. You are to be over our lives. And we are to look to you for our leadership. And, and that we are to seek you out as our king. We recognize that you reign as a sovereign God. And that we are your children. We are your people. And we want to be a reflection for you. You paid for us, Lord. You paid for us on the cross. You bought our lives so that we can have freedom in you. Let us not waste it trying to focus on me. If there's somebody on my heart, Lord, I, 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 see, I see some empty seats here. Lord, if there's somebody in this church that we don't see today, that we say, you know what, I, I wonder where such and such is at. I wonder if they're doing okay. That we stop and we take time to call those people and say, are you okay? We drive on over. How you doing? And we look for ways in which we can disciple people and lead people and invite them to be part of our lives. Hmm. Lord, let us be excited about who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I look forward to seeing you guys all again next weekend and hearing your stories on what happened this week. These are the decisions we made. Like, hey, I called this person up. I called that person. Let me know what, how things go. And I'll see you guys next Sunday.